This special broadcast of Governor Sean Parnell's fifth State of the State Address is produced by 360 North. In just a few moments, the governor will be speaking to a joint meeting of the Alaska House of Representatives and the Alaska Senate from the state capitol in Juneau. I'm Rosemary Alexander, News Director at KTOO. With me in the studio is Alexander Gutierrez. Now we go to the governor. Mr. Speaker, Lieutenant Governor, legislators, and fellow Alaskans, thank you for welcoming my family and me here tonight. Uh, I bring three strong women with me. My wife, First Lady Sandy Parnell, my mom, Thelma Parnell, and my beloved aunt, Jeannie Zimmerman. <laughs> so legislators, you and I, have the privilege of serving the greatest people of a mighty state in an exceptional nation. Our job is profound, to secure liberty and create opportunity for all Alaskans. In so doing, we honor the legacy of Alaskans past. We act boldly for Alaskans today, and we will leave a bright future, a stronger Alaska. So thank you legislators and to your staff for entering the arena of public service and for dedicating so much of your lives to better our fellow Alaskans and our state. I also thank members of my cabinet for their service. These men and women undertake an awesome responsibility to faithfully administer the laws you pass. I salute them and I ask you to salute them as well. As I have said many times, Alaska's greatest strength is her people, their courage, and their compassion. As governor, I witness these qualities every day. The courage of our public safety community, three of whom we lost this year, VPSO Tom Madol, Trooper Tage Toll, and Pilot Mel Nading. We also witness the courage of Coast Guard Petty Officer Third Class Travis Obendorf, who we lost following a search and rescue mission. We saw that courage last July when a small plane crash landed outside Talkeetna and stranded two people. The Alaska Air National Guard, which rescued the two victims, set a milestone. The incident represented the 2,000th life saved by the Alaska Air National Guard in nearly 20 years. We honor the service and courage of our National Guard, just as we honor the service and courage of our military members and first responders. They are Alaska strong. Our strength as a state lies not only in Alaskans' courage, but in Alaskans' compassion. I witnessed this courage and compassion last April. Nikki Toll had just lost her husband, Trooper Tage Toll, and burdened with her own grief, she went to the memorial service for Mel Nading, the public safety Hilo One pilot who was lost alongside her husband. Nikki stood with her arm around Denise Nading during Mel's service to show her love and support. The very next day, Denise and her family attended Trooper Toll's memorial in support of his family. Pain so raw, embraced by a compassion so great. We saw compassion at Palmer's Pioneer Home, where a senior suffering from Alzheimer's stood confused and crying in the hallway. One of the Pioneer Home maintenance staff set his work aside, hugged the woman, told her she was loved, and that she was home. Courageous and compassionate Alaskans make Alaska strong. <laughs> Last year, I said the choices we would make in 2013 would determine Alaska's future strength. I asked you to choose wisely and well to keep Alaska strong, and you did. As a result, tonight I can report that the state of our state is strong. Every day it grows stronger, and it's getting stronger by the day. We tackled important policies last year, we made serious choices, and we must do so again this year. 
We must find new ways to use Alaska's resources to drive down the cost of energy. Gas for Alaskans first, and then for the world. That's why last year we created the Interior Energy Project to get lower cost natural gas to Alaskans. That natural gas trucking solution should deliver first gas to Fairbanks in winter 2016. And recently we made historic progress on Alaskans gas line. For the first time, all the necessary parties have aligned to make an Alaska gas line project go. Three producers, a preeminent pipeline builder, the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, and the state agencies responsible for the people's royalties and taxes. You know, because a liquefied natural gas project is so complex, we hired some of the world's most qualified experts to examine Alaska's cost, tax, and royalty structures. We asked them to look for ways we could be competitive in the world market. Alaska can best control her own destiny if we own a stake or participate in the Alaska LNG project. And here's why. Ownership or participation in the Alaska LNG project means the state shares in the profits of the project rather than paying them all to someone else. Ownership also means we will better understand and can more effectively negotiate and ensure the lowest possible costs. With Alaska owning a stake, Alaskans stand to gain more. Next, our proposed phased legislative approval process will be more open and transparent to the public than either the Stranded Gas Act or the Alaska Gas Line Inducement Act. When the Stranded Gas Act and AGEA were passed, everyone assumed that in order to get a gas line, we had to negotiate all the fiscal terms at the outset. That meant the state carried all the risk up front for decisions worth billions of dollars without having the benefit of information, time, and analysis to get it right. Well, we have learned the lessons of history. For the Alaska LNG project, we will insist on terms that any partner would enjoy in a traditional commercial agreement. One where parties make commensurate, proportionate commitments. They go forward in phases. They seek approval from their boards of directors before committing to the next phase of the project. The state will return to its board of directors, the people, by seeking review and approval at all key decision points from legislators. This session, I ask you to work with me to review and decide Alaska's course on this initial phase of the Alaska LNG project. So to keep Alaska strong, I'm asking legislators to review the guidance documents our team has negotiated and take up legislation that would allow us to move through the pre-feed phase of the Alaska LNG project. The pre-front-end engineering and design phase of the project, that's a half billion dollar step in gas line development. Pre-feed refines the costs and engineering challenges the project faces, challenges that must be addressed before the parties commit any additional funds to complete the project. Costs of this 18-month phase known as pre-feed will be shared among the parties. So the state's portion, the state's portion will be between 70 and 90 million dollars. After that pre-front-end engineering and design phase, the administration will come back to the legislature report progress and ask for your commitment and approval before proceeding to the next stage. Now in the past, we've seen efforts to develop a large gas project stall out for various reasons. That's why we'll maintain our backup plan to get Alaska's gas to Alaskans. The legislature wisely addressed this in creating AGDC. AGDC is uniquely positioned to be our ace in the hole. If work falters on the Alaska LNG project, we can still get gas to Alaskans first with AGDC's smaller volume project. AGDC is on track for an open season in early 2015. We're gonna keep it on track. The gas line legislation I ask you to consider is important. It's important to create a competitive investment environment for any project that gets Alaska's gas to Alaskan homes and businesses. The legislation is important to both AGDC's smaller volume gas line project and the larger Alaska LNG project. This has been a dream of Alaskans since 1968 when Prudhoe Bay was first discovered. Our way forward will be on Alaska's terms and in Alaskans' interests. <laughs> Alaska's foundation, our financial foundation, is already very healthy. The books are balanced. 
because we've been disciplined with the people's checkbook. We've built significant budget reserves and preserved our AAA bond rating. In my budget this year, I followed four guiding principles. To live within our means, to meet our constitutional priorities, to fix what we have, and to finish what we've started. To keep Alaska strong, I'm asking you to preserve these principles in the final budget bills. This is especially true now where we face less revenue due to lower oil prices. We must do what the President and Congress have been unable to do, reform spending so we can live within our means during this generation and the next. Washington hasn't made Social Security sustainable, but in Alaska, we can reform our pension system so it is fully funded. Fellow Alaskans, the time is now to tackle our $12 billion pension deficit. Alaska's escalating annual pension payments squeeze dollars from every other program and state service, education, public safety, natural resources, and that vice will soon tighten even more. Without action, our $630 million annual payment will balloon to more than $1 billion. So to keep Alaska strong, I propose we transfer $3 billion of our $16 billion in budget reserves into the Retirement Trust Fund. Next year, this shift will allow us to reduce our annual payment to $500 million instead of more than $750 million. That's a savings of more than 50% in the first year. Our plan will dramatically drop future operating budgets and put us on a more sustainable financial path. Our current economic policies navigated us safely through the Great Recession. And with these policies in hand, the Great Alaska Comeback is underway. Last year, we passed the Moore Alaska Production Act, and now new oil investment dollars, new jobs, better opportunities are flowing into this state. Alaskans are better off under the new tax regime. The People's Treasury <laughs> The People's Treasury takes in more revenue at lower oil prices than under the old tax regime. Last year, we also cut payroll taxes for individual Alaskans. As a result, this year, Alaskans and Alaska businesses will have 55, more, $55 million more in their pockets. Our commitment to a more fiscally responsible government has not gone unnoticed. Business and professional licenses were up 3% in 2013. The Kauffman Foundation ranks Alaska as one of the top four states for entrepreneurship. Alaska's summer visitor volume increased last year for the third consecutive year. George Mason University's Mercatus Center, they reported last week that Alaska's fiscal situation is the strongest in the nation. The Great Alaska Comeback is beginning, and we will make sure it continues for us and for future generations. The brightness of Alaska's future depends on the strength of our children. That strength will hinge on whether we provide them with a high quality education. Three years ago, I set a goal that we would increase our high school graduation rate from the mid 60s to 90% by 2020. Well, I'm proud to report our graduation rate improved in 2013 for the third year in a row. At 72%, we're better off than we were a year ago but we still have a long way to go. The good news is more graduating seniors on a percentage basis have earned Alaska Performance Scholarships. These hardworking students were also much less likely to need remedial courses at the University of Alaska. But what more can we do to prepare these children for life after high school? Well, tonight I propose key changes to keep Alaska strong. First, we must recognize our students need 21st century classrooms to compete in a 21st century economy. Our Alaska Digital Teaching Initiative will give our young people access to quality teachers and instruction. Today, eight districts use video conferencing to reach our more remote schools. Course instruction is delivered in real time, so students can take courses not otherwise available to them. The Alaska Digital Teaching Initiative will empower teachers, will empower them to reach beyond their own classrooms and even beyond their own districts. Digital teaching can bring together students from Tanana and Ruby with Fairbanks students. Not only will students have access to a more diverse array of classes, 
they will have access to a more diverse array of insights. Well, second, we must make sure that what we're doing now is working. Last year, we demonstrated that the Terra Nova assessment was unused and unneeded by the districts. So in 2013, the Alaska Department of Education eliminated the Terra Nova testing requirement. This year, I propose repealing and replacing the obsolete high school graduation qualifying exam. Like Terra Nova, it's no longer a valid measure of student success. The qualifying exam measures student progress against our state's old education standards, not against Alaska's new, more rigorous standards. Alaska's standards set by Alaskans. Today's qualifying exam doesn't measure readiness to graduate, doesn't measure readiness for career training, preparedness. Well, in its place, I propose a high school student take either the SAT, the ACT, or work keys test within two years of their expected graduation date. The first test they would take would be at state expense. So rather than a highest stakes test of limited value, we'll have better information from these tests and they will open the door to a young person's post-secondary education or job training. Third, school districts should allow more high school students to test out of a class for credit. Nothing is gained by requiring a student to take a seat in a class whose subject matter he or she has already mastered. Let's reward that student's achievement. Let's offer them more opportunity to enhance their skills and knowledge. <laughs> I'm going to keep you around, Senator Coghill. Fourth, we must offer educational paths that reflect the choices and interests of all our students. Career technical education is a strong pathway to success, and many of our students would thrive with better access to this path. In the Northwest Arctic Borough last year, career technical edu education classes were again offered in all 12 schools. Offering career and technical classes to students resulted in an impressive 11% increase in the borough's graduation rate. 83% of the students who took two vocational courses in the same career path graduated. 83%, that's, better than, <laughs> that's higher than the state's graduation rate. It's simple. Students excel when they find a subject that inspires them. So to keep Alaska strong, I say we must improve career and technical programs by expanding dual credit options for both high school graduation and certification in a career field. More than 3,700 Alaska high school students currently take advantage of dual credit courses through the University of Alaska. Well, let's open that door to thousands more. In 2000, we created TVEP the Technical Vocational Education Program to provide grants to statewide job training institutions. To keep Alaska strong, this year we should require institutions receiving TVEP funding to establish and maintain partnerships with Alaska schools so students can earn both high school and post-secondary credit towards certification. Finally, we must, we must continue to expand the number and type of regional residential schools which serve our rural students. To keep Alaska strong, we must guarantee more access to these schools by requiring the Department of Education to provide an annual application period for them. We must also increase funding for residential schools. You know, these changes are the easiest ones we can make, but they are not the only ones we must make. To keep Alaska strong, we need more significant reforms that create more educational opportunity for our children. Until now, the debate over education has gener generally proceeded from two fronts. On one side are those who believe reform begins and ends with increased funding. The other side, myself included, we focused on results. What are we getting for what we're already spending? In the past, both sides have dug into their respective positions instead of rising up and creatively finding the solutions our children so desperately need. Well, tonight, I want each of us to climb out of whichever trench we're in and declare 
that 2014 will be the education session. Let's commit ourselves. Let's commit ourselves to a respectful debate that ends with a plan to offer more opportunity for more to more of our students. I want to start that discussion. I want to start it by going back to basics. The Alaska Constitution. Under Alaska's Constitution, the legislature is required to maintain a system of public schools open to all our children. Public schools must remain free of sectarian control. However, Alaska's Constitution also says no money shall be paid from public funds for the direct benefit of any religious or other private educational institution. But the question of school choice is not about private schools or religious schools. It is about whether parents should have the freedom to say what school best meets their child's education needs with their child's share of public money, their money. <laughs> Wealthier Alaskans can always send their kids to private or religious schools, but others can't and don't get to under our Constitution. Since Alaska's constitutional provision was put in place, the U.S. Supreme Court has affirmed a parent's right to make these choices under what they call the private choice test. The education spending must have a valid secular purpose. The aid must go to parents and not the schools. A broad class of beneficiaries must be covered. The education program must be neutral with respect to religion, and there must be adequate non-religious options. Well, since this Supreme Court decision was handed down in 2002, discussion of school choice in Alaska has gone largely unaddressed. However, members of this body have courageously stepped up to speak about what matters most, educational opportunity flowing from parental choice. You have legislation before you on this topic by Senators Dunleavy, Dyson, Kelly, Coghill, and Giesel, by Representatives Keller, Reinbold, Lynn, and Stoltz. So to keep Alaska strong, I urge the House and Senate to vigorously debate the provisions of SJR 9 and move it to the people for a vote. On this question, whether parents ought to have a greater say in their child's education, it's time legislators let Alaskans decide. <laughs> expanding choice for parents and opportunity for our kids also means expanding charter schools and replicating successful models. In Anchorage, for example, almost 800 students are locked into their current school while their parents have them on the wait list for the Aquarian Charter School. When we have a charter school like this and others with wait lists, we have proven schools that work for kids. We ought to give parents more freedom to replicate it. Well, unfortunately, Alaska's charter school law is one of the most restrictive in the country. We limit these, we limit these schools' rights and we limit their funding. Charter schools and their students are part of the public school system, but don't get equal treatment under the law. And this is grossly unfair. I propose all local, state, and federal funding, except some capped district administrative expenses, travel with a student to a charter school. Also, <laughs> also under current law, a local school district has sole authority to approve or deny a charter school creation with no path to appeal a denial. Let's create an appeal route to the Commissioner of Education. It's time we allow parents some recourse when a district denies their freedom to create the best education for their child. <laughs> real change comes only with real reform. If you are willing to join me in passing real education reform, I will work with you to authorize an increase in the base student allocation. To show my good faith in this, I'm introducing legislation to reform Alaska's education system by focusing on charter school opportunity, career technical training, digital teaching, and other opportunities. And I'm introducing legislation to raise the BSA for each of the next three years. If we're successful at real reform 
and new funding, our children will benefit. So the big items I've talked about tonight, building a gas line, paying down our pension, reforming education, these are issues that matter to us all. And they can bring us all together as a people. Now earlier tonight, I said that courageous and compassionate Alaskans make Alaskans strong. Well, Trevor Millar is a man who exhibits both qualities. He's a natural born leader with a heart full of faith and compassion who mentors high school students through a group known as Young Life. Last June, last June Trevor was inner tubing and jet skiing with some of these young people. A rope became wrapped around his neck and he was dragged behind the boat and nearly strangled to death. While recovering from this severe injury, he had a major stroke. The damage to his brain was described as massive, impairing a complete side of his body. All of the dreams that Trevor had for himself and for the students with whom he worked, they were blurred as he faced a life of immobility. But Trevor has not only a heart full of compassion, he has a heart full of courage. Thousands of people rallied around Trevor, praying for him, sending him notes of encouragement, even traveling to Seattle to be with him in the hospital. And with that, Trevor fought back. Trevor's recovery is described as miraculous. He worked, he worked hard every day to regain his functions. And doctors who once thought he would pass away cannot explain his recovery. Last October, he rolled into South Anchorage High School in his wheelchair, where students welcomed him back. A month later, I witnessed Trevor get up out of his wheelchair. He climbed the stairs of a stage with the help of a cane before about 400 people and began to talk about his journey back and about his hopes for Alaska's high school students. So despite, you know, despite all he's been through in his own life, Trevor wants nothing more than to see these young people succeed in life. So Trevor's courage, his resilience, his compassion make all who meet him strong. So the Alaskans I spoke of tonight, from those we lost to those still living profoundly impactful lives, they set the bar very high. Now it's up to us to take up our challenge to secure more liberty, more opportunity for Alaskans. We have the duty to provide our young people with a better future. A strong Alaska where families worry less about making ends meet and have more lower cost natural gas. A strong Alaska where families suffer less violence and more Alaskans choose respect. A strong Alaska where our retired civil servants don't worry that the health of their pensions competes with the security of their grandchildren's future. A strong Alaska where we afford greater choice and more opportunity in education. This is our mandate and our mission this year. So I look forward to working with you again to keep Alaska strong. So may God bless you. May God bless Alaska. Thank you and good night. Governor Sean Parnell exiting the House chambers where the House and Senate have been gathered to hear his annual State of the State the legis uh, address to the legislature. And in just a few moments, we will go to the response from the House and Senate minority leaders, Chris Tuck and Hollis French, both of Anchorage. Tuck is taking over for Juno Representative Beth Curtula and French for Anchorage Senator Johnny Ellis. The governor's annual speech is usually his sense of the health of the state, as well as his proposal for spending and legislation. Tonight, Governor Parnell outlined his priorities for the year. And some of those, we should begin uh, talking about some of those with uh, education. He is calling this session the uh, 2014 the education session. The governor spent about half the time of his speech on education initiatives, and the big one for school districts is an increase in the base student allocation for each of the next three years. However, the governor had no details on how much, but for districts operating budgets, this will be big. The governor is also calling for a digital teaching initiative, replacing the high school graduation exams, increasing opportunities for technical or vocational education, and he's asking the legislature to pass a 
Choice Resolution. That, of course, was on the it was in the legislature last year. The bill has been moving forward, and uh, this would give voters a chance to decide if public schools should receive or should decide if private schools should receive public funds. The governor also talked about gas line legislation in which he's asking for about 70 to 90 million dollars to get what is called the pre-front end engineering and design phase or pre-feed phase of the Alaska liquid natural gas project moving. He's also planning to transfer $3 billion in budget reserves to a retirement trust fund toward the $12 billion pension deficit. And this was something he proposed in his uh, December, when he rolled out his budget in December, and most lawmakers, I think, are planning on going along with that. They seem to like that idea. In just a few moments, we expect to go to Chris Tuck and uh, Minority Leader Hollis French, the House and Senate. That will be down in the Farron Camp Room. I'm Chris Tuck, the new House Democratic Leader. And next to me is Senator Hollis French, the new Senate Democratic Leader. First, I would like to thank Representative Curtula for her public service. Her leadership and statementship will greatly be missed. And I would also like to thank my colleagues in selecting me as their leader. We have a great team put together, and I really appreciate their trust and faith in me. Democrats want to make Alaska a place where ideas and innovation flourish, our resources are put to good use, where our education is the highest quality, and as a result, the economy thrives and good jobs are plentiful. Like centuries of Alaskans before us, we find confidence and how Alaskans watch out for each other and stick up for one another. And like Alaska's founders of statehood, we took control of our resources against outside entrants intent on exploiting them. We believe in Alaska and its great potential. Hard work, dedication, the will to succeed, these are some of the values that built and pioneered Alaska. As elected leaders, it is our responsibility to put these values to work and to keep them well-being of our fellow Alaskans first in every decision we make. We cannot give up on our hopes and vision of what Alaska can be. The governor has pushed the notions that oil industry boardroom decisions hold the fate of Alaska, and we cannot invest in our children's future unless we do certain provisions. If we give in to those wrong-headed ideas, then we have forsaken the dream of statehood. Alaska Democrats aren't ready to give up on Alaska. On the economy, energy, and education, we are ready to lead. Right now, more than ever, Alaska must make sure we are making smart investments and being smart in the returns we demand. This is how we create jobs and opportunities for all Alaskans. Whether it's oil, gas, or anything else, Alaska must always negotiate from a position of strength. We want to partner with the oil industry and others who want to help develop our resources, but we will not take the back seat in those negotiations. If we allow the state to sell our resources for less than they are worth, if we accept less than Alaska's fair share, we undercut opportunities for Alaskans. And worse, by giving away our oil, the governor took away Alaska's opportunity to rebuild our savings down the road. But it's not too late to turn that around. And we must not repeat those mistakes when it comes to getting Alaska's gas to Alaska homes and businesses and to get Alaska's gas out to markets. We want a gas line. And Democrats have long held that owning a piece of the pipe can be a great way to bring the full benefits of gas line home to Alaskans. However, as we saw with the Murkowski deal a few years ago, the devil is in the details. And if we're going to make sure this is a good deal for Alaskans, we must be strong, smart, and diligent advocates for Alaska's interests in every step of the process. We are prepared to do our job on behalf to make sure we get a gas line that brings the maximum, maximum benefits to Alaskans. We want a gas line, but we cannot afford to give away our gas like our governor did our oil. Similarly, Alaska cannot afford to be penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to teaching our children and training our workforce. 
We must make a lasting commitment to education. It must be the best investment that we can make. We must give our schools the resources they need so our children are not forced into overcrowded classrooms. We're counting on them for our future and they should be able to count on us for the resources they need year after year. But what have we been doing? We've been shortchanging education and crippling it. And now once it's being crippled, normal funding until we see reform. The job of teaching never ends. That's why we are still advocating an increase to the per student classroom funding so we can stop cutting teachers and start building the potential of our future generations. Unfortunately, over the last few years, Alaska has gone from savings to deficits, and our schools have gone from innovating to laying off teachers. But we are ready to turn that around and get Alaska back on track for the strong future our forefathers once envisioned. So know this, we have not forgotten who we work for. We work for Alaskans first and Alaskans always. And with that, I'd like to send, uh, turn it over to Senator Hollis French, our new Senate Democratic leader. Thank you, and it's an honor to uh, be given the opportunity to address you. Representative Tuck has done a good job of articulating the Democratic vision for the state. I'd just like to focus for a few minutes on what I believe will create the greatest likelihood of success for the greatest number of Alaskans, and that's public education. We have to educate the next generation of Alaskans to solve the problems that they will inevitably confront. Remember, education is a constitutional obligation, and it can't be done with half measures, and it certainly can't be done with flat funding. Innovations long embraced by other states, like statewide, voluntary, pre-kindergarten, do not get the attention they deserve from this administration. Keep doing what you've been doing, and you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And for many school districts, the governor's approach, the governor's approach now means cuts to the classroom. Cuts here in Juneau, 30 teachers. Cuts in to the schools in Anchorage, 159 teachers. Cuts in Fairbanks, 60 teachers. Indeed, the school superintendent in Anchorage said that the cuts to the Anchorage school district are, and I quote, unlike anything I have seen in my 23 years in the Anchorage school district. We want to build a stronger Alaska from the ground up. We intend to push for more education funding this session. The state needs an increase in the base student allocation. Schools need money they can count on. The governor claims to have a positive vision for the state, but a vision that does not include a powerful education agenda is not a vision, it's a mirage. Reality demands action. You will see us putting forward measurable, tested, and achievable education reforms. And on the, issues, on the issue of vouchers, I, I listened very carefully to what the governor had to say, and I'm disappointed he's going in this direction. Diverting public money to private schools simply continues to deprive our public schools of the resources they need to do their job. Moreover, it's noteworthy that the governor has decided that waiting lists at certain schools means those schools' programs should be expanded. Here's what he said in a recent interview. When we have a public school called a charter school that has a wait list of hundreds, they're doing something right. We ought to be replicating that. I would say the same thing about Head Start. It has a waiting list of 1,200. So I would say that we, they're doing something right and we ought to start replicating that. Let me turn now to the issue of energy. Energy development can enrich a society. We've seen it work here. We've seen it work even better in countries like Norway. We believe energy development works best when a sovereign acts like a sovereign. The innovative model that we adhere to is known as the owner state the owner state. Visionaries working for statehood confronted skeptics who doubted our ability to stand on our own two feet economically. The answer was to give Alaska control of its vast resources. Keeping in mind that we hold those resources in trust for future Alaskans, we will not apologize for working diligently to maximize the benefit of those resources for all. Doing anything less means we're failing in our duty. We will be talking a lot about the gas line this session, and our approach to the gas line is extremely simple. Gas line, yes. Giveaway, no. 
a pipeline that does not return an economic benefit to the people of the state may as well not be built. How do we build a gas line that's not a giveaway? The key to recognize, the key thing to recognize is that a gas pipeline deal must be structured for the next 50 years. The key term will be access. Access to the gas for consumers at a reasonable price. And access to the pipeline for new oil and gas companies who will come to Alaska. We have seen how smaller companies in Cook Inlet have revitalized those fields. The same thing will happen in time on the North Slope if we do it right. As we consider the gas line, the governor, as we consider the governor's gas line approach, we and many Alaskans have every right to view it with some skepticism. This is the same administration that pushed last year's oil tax giveaway. The public saw through that, and 50,000 of them, Alaskans all, rose up and signed a petition to reverse that bill. They did not need to see the new budget information now coming out that shows that the energy policies of the governor will drain our savings. They just knew it, and they were right. The surpluses we enjoyed just two years ago have been turned into billion dollar, actually two billion dollar deficits. The governor did not mention the fiscal cliff he is driving us towards in his speech. His revenue forecasts, his own revenue forecasts, do not show new oil coming to the rescue. It's red ink as far as the eye can see. And the new investment the governor is now touting was already in, in the works a year ago under ACES. We've consistently drawn attention to the steady upward trend in investment and in jobs on the North Slope since 2007, the year we passed ACES. Indeed, a year ago from today, a year ago, the North Slope was already booming. A year ago, the camps there were overflowing. A year ago, investment was reaching all-time highs and a year ago, we were getting our fair share. What we didn't have a year ago was a governor leading a parade every time a new investment was announced. We have offered a positive approach to oil tax reform. There's a smart way to adjust oil taxes that is win, win, win. In conclusion, we must be good stewards of our resource wealth. Energy propels Alaska now and education will continue to propel it in the future. I am optimistic about the state. I thank you for taking the time to let me share my optimism with you. Thank you and good night. This concludes our special broadcast of Governor Sean Parnell's State of the State Address and Democratic Response, produced by 360 North in Juneau. For more programming information, go to our website at 360north.org. I'm Rosemary Alexander, KTO News. Good night from Alaska's capital city.